Hello, sports history fans. This is Joe Ziemba. I'm the host of When Football Was Football here on the Sports History Network. And before we jump into another sports history adventure, let me tell you about this episode's new sponsor. We at the Sports History Network have partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States where you can get great deals on over 30,000 autograph sports collectibles. Rochester Sports Autographs even have film, music, and other entertainment autographs on the site. So, there's really something for everyone. Perhaps you're looking for a gift for Mother's Day already, or Father's Day. Heck, who needs a holiday as an excuse to give a piece of sports history to your loved ones? Or how about a gift for yourself? Today seems like a great day to add to your sports cave, right? But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes, so there are no extra markups. And they choose to pass the savings on to the customer. All orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and a money-back guarantee. And to make sure RSA knows the Sports History Network sent you, we created a special link for you. All you have to do is head to the following. ShopRSA.com forward slash SHN. That's ShopRSA.com forward slash SHN to get your piece of sports history today. Hi, baseball fans, and welcome back to the ballpark. This is the Pastime Timeline Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Wilkinson, and in this episode, we're looking at the 1903 Major League Baseball season, really the first year where you can call it Major League Baseball. In the same year the Wright brothers discovered air travel and Henry Ford put the first motor vehicle on the market, the game of baseball began to take off as an industry, much like the transportation sector soon would. But first, the game's world had to secure peace and stability. The overwhelming success of Van Johnson's American League in just two seasons as a major league pushed the established National League to the negotiating table. The AL had raided NL rosters and already gained the upper hand in attendance in several key markets. A couple more years at that pace could have put the older league in existential jeopardy. The problem needed to be addressed before the 1903 campaign commenced. It was time to return the competition to the field alone. Johnson led the AL delegation to the Peace Committee meetings in Cincinnati, while newly elected President Harry Pulliam headed the NL camp. I think it's fitting to note that the host city of the first known pro team would be the site of these talks. Pulliam had been elected in December 1902 to pursue peace. After several meetings, the national agreement was agreed to in early January, making the league separate but equal. Teams could no longer entice players in the other league to jump for more money. The reserve clause would be honored by both leagues, and there would be common contracts. There were disputes, however. The rights to 16 players were challenged, with nine of them ultimately being awarded to the AL team. I think what happened was that the players had signed their reserve contracts from their prior team before being lured away with a contract from the other league, and they had to dispute, and this was the offseason before 1903. So this was a clear win for the AL, who signed away stars such as Wee Willie Keeler and Sam Crawford in the final stage of the war. The entire big leagues would play under a common set of rules, meaning the AL had to agree that foul balls before two strikes on the batter would be counted as strikes. That alone would balance the statistical scales between the leagues, particularly in terms of batting average and on-base percentage. Also, the pitcher's mound was set at a standard of 15 inches of height. That will fluctuate, we'll see, throughout history. Despite a lack of bargaining power, the NL did make a last-ditch desperate attempt at remaining the only major league. Pulliam offered to accept four AL teams as part of a 12-franchise merger but the AL swatted that prospect away without flinching. In fact, the question begging to be asked is why would Johnson promote a truce at all when his league had all the momentum? He could have decided to extend the war and perhaps eventually put the rival league out of business. 
But Johnson, like Albert Goodwill Spaulding before him, was a statesman and a true ambassador of the game. He knew having two full and successful leagues was the best thing for baseball. But of course, Johnson also received notable concessions from the rival league, none bigger than the official placement of the AL's Baltimore franchise in New York City. The team was bought by a pair with suspected ties to gambling and political corruption and played in a new ballpark constructed at the highest point of Manhattan. This would be the last franchise relocation for 50 years in the game. The AL did have to agree to stay out of Pittsburgh, and that city has remained a National League stalwart to this day. The organized sports government would be a three-man national commission formed by league presidents Johnson and Pulliam, as well as Cincinnati president and Johnson friend Gary Herman as the ostensibly objective tie-breaking vote. In 1903, Johnson banned any type of gambling from AL ballparks, but ironically it was the biggest game-fixing scandal in sports history that would take power out of his hands and into those of a single MLB commissioner fewer than 20 years later. The national agreement aimed to, quote, perpetuate baseball as the national game of America and to surround it with such safeguards as to warrant absolute confidence in its integrity and its methods and to promote and afford protection to such professional baseball leagues and associations as may desire to operate within its provisions, unquote. The National Association of Professional Minor Leagues also signed, as all leagues major and minor pledged to work together to grow the sport. Once the overall agreement was in place, the regular season unfolded without much drama. Boston in the AL and Pittsburgh in the NL had their respective pennants in hand by mid-September. Part of the national agreement stated the two league champions could agree to stage a Major League World Championship Series, the first such affair since 1890. Boston owner Henry Killalay and Pittsburgh's Barney Dreyfus were each up to the challenge. The biggest obstacle ultimately was making sure the Boston players got paid for the extra work, their contracts expired on October 1st, but they were guaranteed two-week salary plus proceeds. The series was seen as free publicity in a decade when owners started a mass marketing campaign. So the first modern era World Series was on. And we'll discuss that quite eventful series to close this episode. Now the timeline of events for the Major League season of 1903. It was January 9th when, after the series of meetings in Cincinnati, the National and American Leagues agreed to coexist as two separate but equal leagues. January 12th, shortly after being named Detroit's new player manager, pitcher Wynn Mercer commits suicide in San Francisco after being suspected of misappropriating gate receipts from California Winter League games. It seemed he needed the money for his gambling problems. March 12th, the Greater New York Club of the AL is officially admitted. The roster is filled with well-known stars to help the team compete with the NL franchise in town. April 14th, a disgruntled Ed Delahanty reluctantly returns to Washington's AL team when the peace agreement nullifies a three-year contract he had signed with New York of the National League. April 17th, Brooklyn stages its first Sunday home game of the 20th century by charging fans no admission to get around blue laws, but requiring them to buy a scorecard to enter. Brooklyn beats Boston on that day 9-0. May 6th, Chicago wins despite tying the AL mark with 12 errors in one game. They were helped out by the opponent as Detroit commits 6 in the same contest. May 11th. In his first start since throwing a perfect game six days earlier, Boston Cy Young blanks Detroit 1-0 in 15 to extend a scoreless inning streak that would eventually reach 45. In the process, he extends his major league record for hitless innings to 24. May 17th, Cleveland and New York of the American League play a contest in Columbus, Ohio, because Sunday games are not allowed in Cleveland, the displaced home team wins 9-2. June 9th, Philadelphia's NL squad scores a run off rookie Kaiser Wilhelm in the fourth inning at Pittsburgh to snap the home team's record of 57 straight scoreless innings. 
June 25th, Boston National League pitcher Wiley Pyatt works both ends of a doubleheader and despite giving up just one earned run the entire day, becomes the last pitcher to lose two complete game starts in a single day. July 2nd, a very sad note. Remember I mentioned Ed Delahanty going back to Washington, not being happy about it. Well, he abandoned his Washington team in Detroit after some rules violations. Then he boards a train and is thrown off, reportedly for rowdy behavior. Then as he's trying to walk the trussle above, he falls to his death trying to cross the railroad bridge over the Niagara River. Now, to this day, I believe that the true information as to what really happened is not known, but a very, very sad note. His lifetime batting average of 346 puts Delahanty into the Hall of Fame. In better news that day, Jack Dosher becomes the Majors' first second-generation player. His father, Herm, played for three teams in the 19th century. July 14th, in a 4-3 12-inning win over Boston, Cleveland shortstop John Goschnauer ties a 15-year-old Major League record for the longest game at short without a single chance in the field. However, Goschnauer would still make a 20th century record 98 errors. July 17th, Rube Waddell of Philadelphia AL is charged with assault against a heckling fan. August 1st, Waddell holds eight of nine New York batters hitless, but allows four hits to shortstop Kid Elberfeld, who almost single-handedly gives New York a 3-2 win and sets a record for most hits by one player who amassed all his team's safeties. August 7th, Cincinnati shortstop Tommy Corcoran records a record of 14 assists. August 8th, Iron Joe McGinnity earns the nickname by pitching the first of three doubleheaders he would win this month alone. He would pull off the feet twice in just eight days. Should note that Iron Joe, the nickname, did not come from baseball. It came from the fact he was an iron worker in the offseason. Also on August 8th, another terrible tragedy. The worst ballpark disaster kills 12 and injures nearly 300 more at Philadelphia's Baker Bowl. A portion of the left field bleachers collapses during the fourth inning of the second game of a doubleheader. August 17th, AL President Ban Johnson lives up to his name, banning all gambling from his parks. August 20th, Pittsburgh makes six errors in the first inning of an NL loss to New York. September 3rd, Cleveland's Jesse Stovall registers the longest shutout by a pitcher making his big league debut. He blanks Detroit 1-0 over 11 innings. September 5th, Boston's Patsy Doherty sets an AL record with three triples in a single game. September 14th, Leon Red Ames throws a shortened but official five-inning no-hitter in his Major League debut for New York over St. Louis. September 15th, New York National League rookie Hooks Wiltsey beats Boston 3-2 to establish a major league record with his 12th consecutive victory to start his career. September 17th, Chick Frazier, one of the players banned from playing in Pennsylvania in 1902 after jumping leagues, is back with Philly and throws a no-hitter against Chicago. September 24th, Bill Bradley of Cleveland hits for the cycle and amasses 12 total bases on the day. And then a few noteworthy postseason items. October 26th, former Major League pitcher Bill File is expelled from organized baseball for failing to prove his claims that several Southern League games the past season had been fixed. File is later reinstated. December 12th, the St. Louis National League Club trades rookie pitcher Mordecai Three Finger Brown and catcher Jack O'Neill to Chicago for former ERA champion Jack Taylor and catcher Larry McLean. December 18th, Ban Johnson is elected to another term as AL president with a salary of $10,000 plus a $5,000 bonus. And finally, December 20th, Boston American League acquires pitcher Jesse Tannehill from New York for pitcher Tom Hughes.
All right, let's go through the standings for the 1903 season. We're going to start in the American League. First place in champion Boston, 91 wins, 47 losses. Second place, Philadelphia, 75 and 60, 14 and a half games out. Third place, Cleveland, 77 and 63, 15 games back. Fourth place, New York, 72 and 62, 17 games out. Fifth place, Detroit, 65 and 71, 25 games out of first. Sixth place, St. Louis, 65 and 74, 26 and a half games off the pace. Seventh place, Chicago, 60 and 77, 30 and a half games out. So Chicago falling precipitously over the last two years since they won their pennant in 01. And last place, eighth place, Washington, 43 and 94, 47 and a half games out. And unfortunately for the fans of the nation's capital, that would be an all too common occurrence. Um, until they finally broke through in the 20s. Final National League standings. First place champion, three-time champion, Pittsburgh. 91 wins, 49 losses. Second place, New York, 84-55, and 55, six and a half games back. So John McGraw making tremendous strides in his first full season there as manager. Third place, Chicago, 82-56, and 56, eight games out. It seemed to be a good race for a while between Pittsburgh, New York, and Chicago, but the uh, defending champs pulled away in the end. Fourth place, Cincinnati, 74 and 65, 16 and a half games back. Fifth place, Brooklyn, 70 and 66, 19 games out. Sixth place, Boston, 58 and 80. They were 32 games off the pace. Seventh place, Philadelphia, 46, excuse me, 49 and 86. 39 and a half games behind. And last place, St. Louis, 43 and 94, 46 and a half games out. And now the league leaders for 1903, starting in the AL again. And once again, Napoleon Lajoie wins another batting title for Cleveland, 344. I also saw uh, books where it was 355. Not sure if that was a mistake, but it seemed like 344 was the. Uh, more common record for him there, so we're going to go with that. Home run champion and also RBI champion, same guy, Buck Freeman of Boston, 13 homers, 104 RBI. Harry Bay of Cleveland wins the stolen base title with 45. And in terms of runs scored, Patsy Doherty of Boston, 107, pacing the league. Pitching leaders wins once again Cy Young, 28, and that seems to be his title just about every year. ERA champion Earl Moore of Cleveland, 1.74. And in K's, Rubois Bell, once again over 300, 302 for Philadelphia. National League leaders, batting champ, Honus Wagner, Pittsburgh, 355. This was the first year where Honus settled in at his shortstop position which he'll pretty much maintain the rest of his career. He did bounce around a little bit, but until that point, he had really been a utility player. Home run leader, Jimmy Sheckard of Brooklyn with nine. So the home run uh, totals in the National League remain lower than the American League at this point. RBI leader, Sam Mertis of New York, 104. Stolen base, two guys with 67. Sheckard, who I just mentioned, Jimmy Sheckard of Brooklyn, and Frank Chance of Chicago. Noteworthy because Chance is a first baseman. I believe that's still a record for uh, stolen bases for a first baseman. Runs leader, Ginger Beaumont of Pittsburgh, 137. So the former batting champ for Pittsburgh, uh, once again leading the league in runs scored. In terms of pitching, wins leader, Joe McGinnity leads all of baseball, 31 and his teammate Christy Mathewson bringing up the rear on him with 30. So two 30-game winners for New York, and that's going to pay off in the next few years for them. McGinnity, the Iron Man, 434 innings pitched, which was a National League record at the time, and I assume still is. That's an incredible number. ERA winner, Sam Lever of Pittsburgh, 2.06 for the season. And as I mentioned, Mathewson uh, building his legacy as a tremendous performer. 267 strikeouts to lead the league for John McGraw's New York. 
And finally, we have a postseason to talk about, the first ever World Series. This 1903 Major League Baseball Championship Series served as an informal trial run for the formal World Series, which would begin in 1905. The best of nine format used in the 03 series would be used a few more times, but would ultimately be dropped in favor of a best of seven series. Similar to the early years of the NFL versus the AFL in the Super Bowl, the established league's champion was viewed as an overwhelming favorite. The National League desperately wanted to prove that despite the setbacks it suffered, it still played a superior brand of baseball. And for the first four games, it appeared Pittsburgh was well on its way to a decisive victory, but the NL would suffer another L before 1903 ended as Boston rallied for a 5-3 series win. Boston's fans had a huge hand in turning the series around. Led by the Royal Rooters fan club, they berated the Pittsburgh players and downright annoyed them with nonstop singing of the song Tessie. The fight song from a 1902 Broadway show would be resurrected as Boston's next run of titles a century later. The original version came ad nauseum throughout the series by the Rooters, one of whom was the mayor of Boston and the grandfather of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Boston coasted to the pennant by 14 and a half games behind the pitching trio of Cy Young, Tom Hughes, and Bill Deneen, who all surpassed 20 wins. Buck Freeman led the AL in homers and RBI, as I mentioned, while Patsy Doherty set the table, scored a league-high 107 runs. The club had 112 triples during the regular season. I believe it was easier to hit triples back then because of certain ground rules in the outfield, because they would have fans coming up right up against a rope, and certain uh, ballparks, if it went into the crowd, it would be an automatic triple, so much more prevalent then than it is now, but 112 triples, certainly uh, a lot easier to score lots of runs if the guy ends up on third base. The incomparable Wagner won the batting title and paced the Pittsburgh attack along with player manager Fred Clark and league runs leader Ginger Beaumont. All three hit over 340. Deacon Philippe became Pittsburgh's new ace during the season following the defections of Jack Chesbro and Jesse Tannehill to New York. The control master Philippe posted a mark of 25-9 and during the season. Further filling the void left by Chesbro and Tannehill was 1903 ERA champ 25-game winner Sam Lever. Philippe's Herculean performance in the first World Series is noteworthy, but in the end unfulfilling. He threw five complete games out of eight games played, going 3-2 and two with an ERA under three. His victories in games 1, 3, and 4 put Pittsburgh up 3-1 to one in the series. However, he lost game 7, 7-3, seven and then the clincher 3 nothing to Deneen in game 8, Philippe had to work more than half of the innings in the series. Despite being huge favorites, Pittsburgh simply ran out of pitching. But the Pittsburgh lineup must share much of the blame as well, whether it was Tessie or Boston's pitching. In five losses, the three-time NL champ scored a total of eight runs. In Game 1, Jimmy Sebring hit the first World Series home run of all time. He drove in four in Pittsburgh's 7-3 win. Bill Deneen tossed a three-hit shutout in Game 2, a 3-0 Boston victory. Doherty supplied the offense in that game with a pair of homers. Philippe won Game 3, 4-2 in Boston. In Game 4, 5-4 in Pittsburgh, he held off a late Boston rally in the ninth inning in Game 4, and it looked like Pittsburgh was well on its way to the title. But Boston's comeback started in western Pennsylvania, spurred on by the Rooters who'd made the trek there. Young six-hitter and four triples by Boston started the climb back with an 11-2 win in Game 5. Deneen bested Lever in Game 6, 6-3 six to, to even the series 3-3. Three three. Triples by five Boston players beat Philippe 7-3 in Game 7 to give Boston their first lead of the series at 4-3. And then Deneen earned the non-existent MVP award by tossing his second shutout and his third win overall a four-hitter to close out Pittsburgh 3 to nothing. So that was the first ever World Series. It would take a year off, sadly, and then come back in 1905. We'll get into why it was canceled uh, in our next episode. But that's the 1903 season. I apologize for the length of this episode. There's a lot to pack in. 
Things will start to calm down as the years go along, however. That's it for this episode of the Pastime Timeline Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Michael Wilkinson, and have a great day. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Darren Hayes, host of the Pigskin Dispatch and Jersey Dispatch Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed another great episode here on Sports History Network. Now, speaking of sports history, this episode was brought to you by Firefly Books, and they have two great ones for you this summer. For basketball fans, they have the NBA 75, the definitive history by author Dave Zaram, who's appeared on our Jersey Dispatch podcast recently. He tells about the experience, the thrilling journey of the NBA from its humble beginnings to its modern glory. Uncover the untold stories of triumph, controversy, and the greatest stars of the game. This isn't just a book. It's courtside seats to over 75 years of NBA history. And for the golf enthusiasts, swing into the golf round I'll never forget by Matt Adams. Relive 50 of golf's most memorable moments through the eyes of the legends themselves. From Garcia's triumph at the 2017 Masters to Nicholas' miraculous 1986 comeback, it's the closest you'll get to walking the fairways with golf's greatest. Get your summer read on. Grab a copy of NBA 75 or The Golf Round I'll Never Forget. Available online or at your favorite bookstore.